Hi, thank you so much for having me here today. And I have a plan, I'm gonna kinda stick to my plan, but I was so inspired by the last speeches and especially for um, George's discussion of his museum work, so I wanted to start off actually showing out what some of you all are going to be practicing today. Um, and in fact, I felt like since this is really about re-envisioning the humanities and I think reflecting the desires of my graduate students and community members, I'm not gonna be doing a traditional talk. And in fact, I'm gonna do some listening with you all and have you all actually talk to each other and respond out. So just, you know, brace yourselves. That's what's gonna happen. Um, so, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about this thing called radical listening in a bit. I'm gonna give you some theories behind it and how we use it in action. But I wanted to begin here um, with a, a picture of how we do radical listening. So I am um, a professor of communication. I um, have actually um, now a full professor of communication who's never taken a communication class. Uh, I was here as a first generation student and undergraduate in uh, American civilization at the time and in uh, modern culture and media. It, I did all of the classes to complete my double major, my double concentration, and it cost $400 to actually file for both and so I chose not to do that, which, you know, I think is, 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 is a interesting, you know, now that I'm a professor and an administrator, I often think about that, um, that low bar and what that would have meant to me to have that second degree in that second ceremony. Uh, so, so one of my jobs is I direct the Center for Communication, Difference, and Equity. And we, uh, we began in 2015, um, really after Ferguson, and realizing that our students needed a legitimized space within the university to talk about activism and scholarship together. We started with a series of teach-ins and have a number of different projects around it, including our Interrupting Privilege project, which is a racial dialoguing program. It began in 2016, um, just in that fall of 2016, as our former president came into office. And um, we found ourselves to be this really necessary space of racial dialoguing. We have both intra-racial versions, and you can see here, this is, uh, this is the home page of the website here. And so this is one of our, oops, our intra-racial programs here. On the left um, is Marcus Johnson, who's one of my PhD students, will be defending his dissertation uh, in, in the spring. And on the right um, is a, a collaborator who was formerly at Seattle University and is now at um, Villanova, um, Professor Holly Ferraro, who uh, is going to now take us through our first kind of cross-country iteration of, of interrupting privilege next fall as we do a focus on black capitalism. So this is one of our intra-racial versions. We've had many interracial versions of this as well. We have lots of community partners. We have undergraduates. We have um, graduate students. I have graduate students who have done their dissertations on this program. Um, I've written two, of, my, my last book was, was based on the methodologies of radical listening that we use here. I'm writing a new book on this. And I've, I've had the pleasure of doing a lot of co-authorship with my graduate students, something that I didn't learn as a, um, as a PhD student uh, in ethnic studies um, with a humanities focus, but that I've come to embrace and actually require of all of my new PhD students coming in. Um, so, from here, Trouty taught me what to do, and so I will share this out with you later. We have stuff about the methodology. The coolest piece of this here is that the recordings, and we're gonna to listen to some of these recordings, are, um, are by theme, and so you can listen to a variety of different topics here that are guided by, um, by our, our, our participants and our themes that have ranged from, in our first year, our theme was on the first time you've ever remember, remembered experiencing racial discrimination through what does it mean to be black in Seattle to um, we trans transform this into quarantining while black over the, um, over the, the pandemic. And this year we're doing this, this theme on resistance through resilience. What does it mean to actually take care of your body in these spaces um, when you are often resisting? So that's my little bit of a preamble. So you'll know what you're looking at here. So, so I'm gonna talk about the, this role of radical listening uh, in thinking through what does it mean to re-envision the PhD. 
I'm going to start, again, this is going to be different from other talks, with the norms, which is in our sessions. We always talk about, about norms. Um, the first one is for listening for understanding. So um, in the way that, that many of us, particularly academics, are listening in a way in which you're thinking, how am I going to have a perfect response next? Um, to not do that, to really hold when you're going to be paired up with someone to what your partner is saying. Um, and, and not actually um, coming at them from this position of, of argumentation. Uh, to think about how do you in this, in, in this little small space, in this little example of what you're going to do here, um, speak your own truth without burden of having to represent all of your people, whoever you imagine your people to be, and then paired with as a listener, uh, listening in a way in which you are not hearing um, your conversation partners representing all of their people, whoever you might identify them to be. Um, this, I, I, this is always uncomfortable work. I can imagine in a forum like this, this will feel a bit odd to, um, to lean into it for the share, very short period of time that we're going to be doing our exercises together and then to calling each other into this experience, which is a whole other talk in itself, so I'm not going to pause there. And usually in a session, we would stop and do community norms and go back and forth for a bit, but for the purpose of the time, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on. So I wanted to share with you all uh, a dialogue that happened during our Quarantine Wall Black uh, program. This is a dialogue between Danielle and Aaliyah, who are two black women graduate students uh, at the University of Washington, Seattle, where I teach. They very much wanted their, um, their, their actual names to be used. So these are their actual names, and they are really excited about being a part of this process as well. So we're going to listen to them. Your prompt is to really just kind of hear them for how they're intending to be heard in this space, not thinking about moving to that space of, of argumentation, of debate, um, of problem solving, right? As, as George was pointing out, that this is, this is the, the purview of the, of the social scientists. We're, we're trying to simply hear them for the meaning they're creating here. I, I when you, <clears throat> talk about bearing your soul and giving vulnerability and <clears throat> how you hope that creates change. Um, <clears throat> it made me think about like why I chose to have you here as my dialogue partner. And I mean, it's because if you think, I know for me, you have been one of the main individuals who, it's not even like we talk in depth about these kind of things often but it's like literally the random texts back and forth that it's just like, I'm sending you love and strength. And, you know, being able to just simply be like, I'm having a rough day and I just needed to tell somebody that. Like, I just needed someone to hear that and listen. And I know that's one of the main things I've always appreciated um, about our friendship and our relationship is this ability to just be authentic and to be true and to be real and to not be perfect and to not act like we're perfect um, for the world, for ourselves, for one another. We don't, we don't expect each other to perform for one another. We don't expect each other to spend a lot of energy and time and say, you know, like talk all the time because that would also probably be then turn into a, a sense of um, this is now like a, something on my plate. And I just, I really love the space we've created for one another where we're just here when I need and when you need. It's always a person who will just listen mm -hmm. and who won't extract energy. Um, and who will just give that, like you said, I mean, really, you know, radical listening and just hearing you for who you are and saying, I'm, you know, I'm here. Not even to focusing on the, you'll get through this. These are all the ways you're so great. You know, we don't do that. It's really just like, it was a shit day. Yeah, I know. I feel you, you know. Um, I just know for me, that's been very special. Yeah, I wholeheartedly feel the same. Like I'm, I'm so incredibly grateful for you and just the way that we met and like stayed in each other's lives and just 
fundamentally understood each other too because again like from everything we've shared here in our conversations offline I just know that you fully get it in ways that I don't even have to explain and I can't tell you how safe that makes me feel and how much at peace I feel just knowing there's at least one person in the world that I don't owe anything to like I don't have to put up um, a facade and act like I'm okay when I'm not home feels like a site of labor um, you know I'm disconnected from my academic work for multiple reasons and so I just I'm grateful to find that space and fill a void within you and within this friendship and yeah I'm it just couldn't have come at a better time in my life personally. Um, and again, I'm just so honored to even be included in this opportunity, like as a dialogue partner, because it's felt like so many months of sitting on my feelings have now been able to be released uh, and for me to be heard. And also just to do a lot of like silent head nods and validation and affirmation in ways that feel very defensive when I'm talking with other people or feel very reactive and very uh, um, disembodied. Like I'm losing myself even trying to get through to them. And here I just feel like, wow, this was therapeutic. You know, like, let me pay Danielle for like this counseling <laughs> session. <laughs> it's really, it's really been good for me. Um, and so I just want to say the feeling is completely mutual. Yeah. I just, I noticed so much your identity as both a Black woman and as a scholar or an individual in that academy are almost at odds with one another. At least that's how I felt. I talk, you know, with a lot of people in the Black community a lot of times, and it's like you're, um, you speak funny. <laughs> what are you talking about? These like, I can't talk about my work. Um, and then, you know, in the academy, and it's so, like, you're a Black woman, you're very hyper-visible. And I think I that's what we're talking about here is this idea of, like, our multiple identities being able to be come together and be true and be valued and be understood. And I think as Black women in grad school and in, in this academic system, that's just, it's just not common. And it, and it won't be. All right. So what I would love you all to do right now is to find a partner, so someone that's close by to you, um, if you are apart, if you wouldn't mind joining us for this, please. And if we don't have nice um, divisible by two, we can have a group of three. So that's, that's the plan right now. What, what we're going to do is um, sit with somebody else for just a minute and a half. So if you could take your, your phones and put a minute and a half on your timer, you're going to listen to your partner for just that period of time, responding to the prompt, what did you hear? What did you hear? That's all you have to do for a minute and a half. Uh, we often do this in radical listening as something called um, serial testimony, uh, where we do this, um, people to, to speak their truth, their testimony in a row. So this is an, often a, a, a type of activity we use. And your goal as, um, as speaker and as listener is to speak your truth and not to hold your, your um, listening partner imagined or any otherwise what they are bringing to the conversation. All right? So we will, I don't have a timer up here, but we'll go ahead and start. All right, go ahead. Speaker number one, finish up what you were saying. And speaker number two, begin, please. If we were to do this um, in an actual interrupting privilege session, you all would have some time to, so this is this type of monologic communication, and you'd have some time to do that piece because it's often a very unnatural way of responding, and so you have some time to actually connect up. So um, 
my new friend Zachary here is going to bring the mic around um, for people who were responding to, what did you hear? What did you hear? Uh, okay, well, I heard a uh, conversation between two individuals who care a lot for each other and who were uh, talking about the, the precarity of their situation. Um, and uh, a couple of um, phrases struck me, especially in the, the second speaker, talking about how grateful she was that she had a relationship with somebody that she didn't owe anything to. And I assume that she might have been talking about her, maybe her academic superiors or people that she was in some sort of a economic relationship with. Um, also talking about how she felt, if I heard this correctly, that she felt like even her home was a, was it a site of labor? Is that what she said? Mm -hmm. That, um, and so, yeah, they were both, it seemed like they were both saying like, I feel you, I appreciate you, and I, I'm so glad that there's somebody there who can, who can, um, who can sympathize, who understands what I'm going through right now. So that's what I heard. Thank you, thank you. Anybody else, anybody else wanna share out what they heard? One more person maybe? Yep, perfect, thank you. Cool, um, I think we heard um, an emphasis on the, the fact that they felt like they didn't need to consciously filter um, what they were saying and when in communication with one another. And the, um, the, um, fa the non-judgmentalness of the way their communication was received, the lack of trying to you know, solve a problem, but rather on, uh, remaining on the level of validating what they were hearing. Perfect, thank you. And we'll have more time afterwards, um, but, but you all did a, a great job. And I, and I appreciate all of you for, for playing along and for participating here. Um, and I, I, uh, I intentionally played the whole clip. Really, the piece that was on graduate education was toward the end of it, but I wanted that kind of slow roll in because I wanted you to hear their relationship, which I think will be nice that, um, going into the second talk as well. And the importance of that relationship, and this really speaks to some of what, what George was talking about, that um, diversifying our graduate schools and our graduate programs is, um, is about many, many things, um, but this is part of the intangible piece that you can hear here, the, the sisterhood that you hear between um, these two young women and the ways in which they are really using their friendship and their relationship as a counter space to what they're seeing in academia. So, you know, part of what we hear there is the really extractive labor, and that's what you were, what you were referencing, um, that have happens um, for them in their graduate programs, and, and they really contrast this with the reciprocity of their relationship. That, that I have to tell you was formed because, so I'm, I'm an Associate Dean of Equity and Justice in the graduate school. One of the things, one of the programs I work with um, is uh, called Graduate Student Equity and Success, and um, they met there for this Graduate Student of Color program because of very intentional programming that's happening. Um, they talked about the type of disconnection that happens um, uh, through the research, and, and this is in multiple ways. I talk about it on campus as well as in home sites, how they feel disconnected, um, and the sisterhood that is that counter space, um, the ways in which their research often separates them from community, and part of this is not having the faculty who are actually expressing their own connections to community, right, and are not showing how it can be done um, through a wholeness as opposed to in these very separate ways. Right, um, and they talk about how you know that th th they are able to articulate together um, the way in which they bridge community, the inaccessibility of their work, and this means you know the voices from which they are assessed from how they speak in in all of their scholarly products. Right, um, this doesn't feel meaningful to them. Um, and more than anything, and we, we've heard this throughout with, um, with, with graduate students of color and other represented graduate students, the ways in which the, uh, the academy refuses to listen to them, right? Um, and so part of what the work that I do and the work that my graduate students do um, and the work that our undergraduates and our community members that are involved in this project is think about this role of radical listening. And I'm gonna run through this really fast. Um, so radical listening kind of takes us through all of these pieces. Again, I'm going to do this really fast. I'm happy to answer anything that people want to know afterwards, but I want to make sure we get to the end. 
um, from you know, the physiological process of hearing um, to this moment of passive listening, right? For those of y'all who have children and know you're saying their name, you're saying something over and over and over and over again, and then all of a sudden they'll say, oh yeah, I heard, and they'll be able to parrot back what you said, but they haven't actually made meaning out of anything that you've said. So this is what you know, the pass passive listening is about. What's often upheld as the, the highest level of listening by scholars who do this work is this idea of active listening, really about putting your intention on your conversation partner. Um, it means part of the, the pausing of the processes that you all were practicing doing. Um, and active listening often doesn't think about the role of power. Right? So one of the things that active listening often prizes, for example, an identity-based power, um, is uh, the value of eye contact. Um, eye contact is really culturally specific. It's very gender specific. Um, it's very ability specific. So those, um, those who have autism might have a hard time actually making eye contact. So what, what I'm looking at instead is the way in which we can bring questions of power into this listening scholarship as, as some of the theory that undergirds this project. So, so there are tons of scholars. Um, I do very interdisciplinary work. Um, I told you, I, you know, I did, I was an American Civilization, Modern Culture and Media student here. My PhD is in Ethnic Studies. I'm in a communication department. Um, uh, the, as Carol Gilligan is a psychologist, and she talks about, for those of you all who are um, the music theory people, the, the contrapuntal, so the sounds that sound wrong, but actually are the ones that you need to listen to. Um, uh, Tina Camp, who's, who is here, um, has incredible work about listening to the quiet and listening to the silences and, um, and even listening to the sounds that are hard to translate into meaning. Uh, Tanya Dreher, who is a rhetorician, talks about listening against neutrality, so that there are, you know, that, that neutrality doesn't exist, and so we have to import what she describes as political listening into every space. Uh, in a, in a, a similar way, um, Krista Radcliffe, who's also a rhetorician, talks about rhetorical listening, um, where power is always on the table and is always named. So this is instantiated, for example, and I don't know if anyone has ever participated in a difficult dialogues training where before you speak, you have to say all the pieces of your identity, right? So I might say, um, before I say, I raise my hand, I'll say, well, as, um, as, a, as, a, as a mixed race, um, cisgender, um, straight, uh, identified woman, I want to say X, right? So it's very, very clear about all the positionalities from which you're speaking that might be seen and some that might be unseen. And then one of my favorite um, favorite scholars, Wendy Chun, who's, who's um, at, at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver, talks about how your expectation should not be about hearing a point of connection, right? Which is, in thinking about mentorship, how different is this? Um, we heard already about one of the problems of the academy is reproducing yourself, and so looking in a mentoring relationship for a little me, and going into a situation where you're thinking, I'm gonna find this amazing point of connection, and this is gonna bring me to this moment of mentorship where everything opens up for the student. Well, we heard from George already what our numbers are, particularly in terms of black and Latino faculty, right? This leaves, that was like 6% total, so that leaves 94% of our tenure track faculty off the hook in doing truly meaningful mentorship with um, black and Latino students, for example, right? So to enter into a contract of listening where holding up sameness how am I going to find myself this point of sameness is, is really put aside. So these are some of the theories that we use. Um, Oh, I'm gonna go through this really quickly. Joe Kinchlow is the critical education scholar who coined this phrase here. And um, he actually coined the phrase after he passed. And so his, his um, colleagues wrote about it um, afterwards. Uh, so what, what I do in radical listening and in, in my projects is, is thinking about, first off, this process of slowing down. So how do we get people to really slow down in the listening process? So that was a part of your, your, um, your instructions there. This slowing down, so Jennifer Everhart is this amazing scholar of implicit bias. She's a psychologist at, um, at Stanford. 
And she names the slowing down process as that of friction. And I often demonstrate it like this, like there's a heat that arises in your body through this friction, right? Uh, and this friction is actually the moment at which people are able to pause and interrupt bias in many ways. Um, so she's, she's done you know, really impactful work on this. And it's huge in listening, um, thinking about not moving to the spaces of debate. Uh, when you're asking questions, they are legitimately for additional information, they're legitimately for clarification. This is the opposite of what we see performed in just about every academic space, right? Someone is posturing in some way to connect. I'm not saying anybody here today, this is the opposite of everybody here today, but oftentimes to, to connect their own work, right? So it's a pretty selfish form of listening as opposed to how you're holding um, your, your speaking partner. Uh, you don't just listen to stories and you feel your heart swayed and you think about this is the end of it, um, but you think about how you create uh, interventions that are always in concert with those who have expressed some type of, um, of upset, who have talked about their own moments of discrimination. So this is, you know, we teach out for allies. This is about not putting on your own uh, superhero cape to think about how you can save the day. Um, and and there, there's a responsibility as a listener here. There's a clear responsibility as a listener. And so with this, Moving to my close here. Here is the cycle that we work off of with our students, with our community members, um, with the faculty and staff who participate is, is, is moving into the space of, of listening differently. And in my work, I talk about this listening differently, not just to individuals, but also to histories, to institutions, to all of the things that, 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 are, not, um, that are not the dominant narratives. Um, engaging in equitable dialogue. Um, what does that look like in places? Understanding how do you sit with discomfort and really um, develop your own, um, your discomfort tolerance. So I'm, I work with a bunch of people in our resilience lab and talking about um, dialectical behavioral therapy and some of the strategies there to really sit with discomfort. And then um, more dialogue and finally intervention here. And then the final piece is thinking how the individual and is always impacted by the structure on how this is a reciprocal relationship. So in, in graduate education, I have not been in the game for as long as George has, um, but I have, I've been there for 17 years. I've had, um, uh, I've had 12 students who have graduated. I have six black PhD students right now, and I have 100% placement rate on the tenure track. And so this bucks all, all trends, and I do think that people who are doing work on race and representation and race and communication are, are, are different. But part of this is because they have a space with each other and with not just me, but with a network of mentors throughout the university and beyond that have shown that they have a place, um, that they have connection, and that they can really go out then and work to, work to change the structures and the institutions with each other. So um, I apologize for having to, to rush through, but I want to leave time for Kate. Thank you all for listening. Thank you.